All right. Thank you everybody for joining us for today's lunch and learn presentation on understanding emerging museum professionals. Uh, my name is Kaylee Sacco. I am the Associate Director of the Lawrence Hall of Science, which is UC Berkeley's Public Science Center. Um, I am also a member of the California Association of Museums Program Committee and uh, happy to be your uh, facilitator in chief today uh, for this webinar. You will be hearing very little from me, but you will be hearing from our fabulous panelists. Um, we have a great group for you here today from across the state. We have Asia Simmons, Dimitri Broxton, Javier Pasenia, Mikey Farron, and Tiana Lyons King. I'm going to go ahead and um, let you know first that as you heard me in the queue up, uh, we are recording today's presentation. So if you miss anything, you can always go back and listen to that. Um, you can also feel free to share the link, which will be sent to you with colleagues who weren't able to make it today. And lastly, I'll just plug one more time that these Lunch and Learns are regular um, activities of the California Association of Museums. We hope that today's will not be the only presentation that you attend. Before we dive into, I'll let you know, you should have access to a Q&A box. So as we go through, you'll have opportunities from the panelists to uh, share questions and discussion points, but feel free to pop those in at any time during the presentations. We will be watching, monitoring, and responding um, at the appropriate moments. So just wanna let you all know again that this event being part of CAM's Lunch and Learn free webinar series, is exclusively sponsored by the University of San Francisco Museum Studies MA program. Uh, the University of San Francisco offers a unique master's degree in museum studies, preparing students for leadership positions in artistic, cultural, and heritage organizations that operate in a continuously changing social dynamic. Go Dons. <laughs> And there is a link, uh, Michelle just put a link to the program into the chat so that you can uh, take a look at that. Questions. Now let's go ahead and advance. We went over a little bit of housekeeping. I'll also let you know that the captioning is available. And the land acknowledgement. Um, I actually, because I'm sharing my screen, don't have the text in front of me that we normally use, but I'll let you know that I am speaking to you from um, land uh, that was originally on the territory of the Ohlone people in the San Francisco Bay Area. All right, now let's dive into our first presentation. Uh, take it away, team. Thank you, Kaylee. And just to add on for the land acknowledgement, if you live in California, if you look up the Shauni land tax, it is a way for us to repair harm and detrimation that happened during the genocide of um, the Native people. So if you would love to give back and you live in California, please Google the uh, Shauni land tax. And with that being said, um, we're going to start. My name is Asia Simmons. I'm the president of Bay Area Emerging Museum Professionals. And I will be presenting with my colleagues, Dimitri Boxton and Javier Placido. Uh, so if you could move on to the next slide. What we like to do is we like to start off with a few definitions. Um, Bay Area EMP is all about inclusion and diversity. And with that, I'm just gonna read you a couple of definitions. So inclusion, um, inclusion is the universal human right. It moves beyond diversity and towards creating an, an equitable environment where the richness of ideas, backgrounds, and perspectives are harnessed. Inclusion is the act of creating space where each person is authentically valued, respected, and supported. Inclusion is, be, is belonging, agency, and ownership. Diversity. Diversity means our different identities such as age, race, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status, physical, mental ability, sexual orientation, spiritual practices and beliefs, employment status, geographical location, and other characteristics. And diversity encompasses all. Equity, where a person or a group receives the unique opportunities needed to reduce or eliminate barriers, equity is demonstrated. It is a process that begins by acknowledging an unequal starting place and works to correct to correct and address imbalance. 
Equity ensures that people have the opportunity to grow, contribute, and develop regardless of their identity. Equity is not equality, it is getting people what they need. Access also refers to accessibility. This refers to the equitable right engagement or entry for everyone, regardless of human ability and experience. For organizations, it refers to how they encompass and celebrate characteristics and talents that each individual brings. It is about representation for all. Access refers to, it refers to engagement, information, and decision-making. And last but not least, which is my favorite, is liberation. The gaining of equal rights for full social or economic opportunities for a particular group, including the protection from abuse or exploitation. It is ultimately freedom from oppression, allowing one to be their whole self. Liberation is showing up as your whole self. And so with those definitions, we are gonna keep those within the conversation um, as we talk today. And so now we're just gonna, we're gonna dive into some questions for Dimitri and Javi. Um, if you guys would, could you please tell us what your experience as an emerging POC was like? Javi, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, sure. So um, I will um, just kind of start by giving you all a little bit of context of my background. Um, I am an arts administrator um, and uh, an higher ed administrator, and my professional background's a little bit all over the place, but uh, I've worked in higher ed as an admissions officer for nearly four years, uh, and I worked on multicultural recruitment, working with community-based organizations and native recruitment in my past professional endeavors. Um, and this time in my life as an admissions officer really influenced my understanding of the inequities playing out in the secondary education and higher education fields around the country. Um, since then, though, I've worked at other universities, MoMA's Museum Education Department, um, and most recently I was a project manager for Arts and Design Department uh, for the Metropolitan Transportation Authority in New York. So again, uh, a little bit varied, but uh, my position now, my, my title is the Program Manager for the Museum Studies Master's Program at USF. So if any of you have any questions about the program, please feel free to add them in the chat and I'll address them. Um, it's kind of a mix of everything I've done. Um, I'm, I'm really enjoying the position and I'm lucky to have landed at a university whose ethos is really tied to uh, social justice and a sense of progressivism. Thankfully, I'm in a position now where I feel supported. Uh, and though as, as though my opinion and thoughts matter, um, though that certainly hasn't always been the case. Um, but a long roundabout way of answering your question, Asia, is, um, you know, I currently run the admissions process for the master's program. I help plan events and market the program. I help students find internships and advise them in that capacity. Um, and I do whatever the job entails on any given day. So it's uh, a lot of different hats. Um, so that's just a little bit of background. And um, in thinking through sort of the main prompt of this discussion, navigating barriers and unwritten rules for emerging people of color, um, it's a really heavy topic, obviously, and I'll be forthright in saying how uncomfortable I am talking about that 100% openly with the larger group about this, because, you know, what can really be said about the traditional unwritten rules? Uh, the traditional rules as I've lived them in former toxic work cultures are as follows. You code switch to be palatable, you stay humble and you keep your head down, you don't complain or you don't ask for much, um, and you live with the indignities of microaggressions and or blatant racism because you don't wanna ruffle any feathers. But um, I don't really wanna talk about unwritten these unwritten rules because I, I don't think in fact that they are liberating. I think they impede liberation, obviously. Uh, what I'm more interested in this conversation is thinking about modes of liberation, thinking about concrete action items we can take as communities of color to not only navigate barriers, but to dismantle them. Um, so that's the topic I really want to address today. And I think we'll probably talk a little bit a bit later, but uh, you know, specifically mentorship and uplifting voices um, are two tangible ways that we can go about that um, moving forward. But I've already spoken too long, so let's move along. Dimitri. No, you, that, that was great, Javi. I, I, I love that perspective. And I think, you know, it's also important for us to shift the way we talk and, in, in, you know, in this virtual, you know, space, as opposed to when we're all, you know, being able to see everyone's face that we're talking to. Um, so thank you for acknowledging that. Um, I am the Senior Director of Education at Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. I also sit on the Bay Area Emerging Museum Professionals 
board with um, Asia Simmons, um, as well as I'm on two advisory panels for um, San Francisco State University's uh, Museum Studies program, where I graduated from, Go Gators. Um, I hope some of y'all are in the house today. Um, and I actually started my museum career very, very early. <laughs> Before I really knew what museums were, I was an art uh, practice major as an undergrad student and museum seemed like the, you know, other, you know, it, for me, it felt like I had two options, be a starving artist um, or go into teaching. And then I discovered museums as a third option. Um, and so in 2003, I started working at, a an art museum in the Midwest in Indiana to be specific about it um you know where I was told that I was overqualified for the positions that I was applying for um but then just kept seeing barriers to my progress um so I kept applying to jobs that I thought were more or I was told was you know were more um uh, on my level and then just really got disillusioned with museums for a long, long time to tell you the truth. Um, and I ended up coming to work at Museum of the African Diaspora in 2006 as a teaching artist. Um, I think being within the context of a culturally specific museum where the culture that I belong to um, is celebrated and uplifted um, eliminated a lot of those barriers. I think over the years, I have flirted with going back to a primarily white institution and I've had lots of red flags that keep me <laughs> away from from making that transition because I feel very comfortable like I you know being at a primarily black institution I can speak my truth if I don't ad agree with leadership I can openly say that you know whereas I find that you know as Javi was talking about with code switching you know, being in those spaces, I don't feel as my, you know, as my voice is, is listened to as much or, or respected um, or honored. So, so it's a difficult, sp you know, space to be in um, with that. But yeah, I also want to do like you, Javi, since we have such a short amount of time, switching to like, what can we do? Um, what are the ways that we can liberate ourselves? Yeah, with that being said, um, and thank you both for saying uplifting voices, how can we uplift emerging voices um, that way that they feel li liberated, but also that they feel included, right, where they have that agency, belonging, and ownership, but how can we do that specifically for POCs? Yeah, I think one major, looking back on my career, one major component of that is mentorship, um, not only for current POCs to have uh, emerging POCs to have people above them who have sponsored, uh, who have mentored them, but also uh, looking to the new generation and being mentors to uh, to students, to uh, even younger emerging professionals. Um, you know, I, I look back at my professional history, uh, my professional career, and, you know, I'm eternally grateful to have had mentors of color, uh, Peter Johnson and Diane McCoy at Columbia specifically, who taught me my worth. And I think that was especially helpful for me as a newly minted professional and in grad school where that worth can be questioned. Question. So um, yeah, I think uh, mentorship is huge, um, you know, and it they provided me some healthy ways of navigating traditional white spaces and uh, grounding myself in what we're all doing this for. Um, because, you know, some of us are doing it for pro professional growth and personal ambition. Um, I don't think many of us are doing it for the money. Um, but, you know, I think at least for me, I entered this field as a type of a saboteur. Uh, I love museums and I love communities of color. And I love the untapped possibilities when these worlds meet. Um, and so I entered because I wanted to shake things up. I wanted to break down walls and, you know, I wanted to throw a big middle finger to the man. So I think mentorship and uh, being able to be a voice uh, to younger generations and um, also having mentors above you, I think that that's um, one key component of uh, that that could lead to liberation. Yeah, um, if can you switch to the next slide? please just want to sorry the next next slide <laughs> one more um so yeah the the Mellon Foundation did this report back in 2019 I just want to call really quickly um I won't dig deep into this but when we look at the museum field this is from 2019 um so the data is from 2018 so some things may have changed um the museum field as a whole has made progress in terms of gender um you know the the Museum field is primarily female, 
Um, however, what this is not showing is the leadership. Um, I guess it is all the way to all the way to the right in terms of like sea level staff. Women are making progress. It's still slow progress um, within leadership. But if you move to the next slide. I'm just zipping through these really, really quickly. Folks can look this up. I left the QR code up there. Where we're not progressing is in terms of um, race and, ethnic and ethnicity. Um, there's still a dearth of people of color within the museum field. And you know, I think this is really important. When I go to speak at museum studies programs, I often find that there's maybe one other person that looks like me, and, and I'm not particularly dark either, but you know, so I, I am often the darkest person in the room when I go to museum studies programs or if I go to museum conferences. So I think to diversify the field, we really have to start there. Um, you know, I think the work that Javi does, I, I love that you went to, you know, historically black universities and colleges on the East Coast to let folks know that museums are even a viable option. I certain, you know, like I said at the beginning, I fell into museums as like this third option for myself, not even knowing that I could pursue museums as a career. And so I think it's important um, that programs, I'm gonna big at my university, San Francisco State again, um, you know, that started the um the the minor for undergrad students in museum studies. And so that program is essential for going to ethnic studies students to go to students in the art department um, that are studying um, anthropology, for example, to even let them know that museums are an option. When I was in an undergrad, no one told me, you know, there was an art museum attached, but I thought, you know, that was for when I someday become like Picasso or, or Basquiat and, you know, as a place that my music, that my art could um, actually be on display. But I think oftentimes we don't think of letting folks know that there's a variety of careers outside of being a curator um, within museums. And so I think, you know, not only mentorship, but I think museums really need to focus on um, their internships programs, um, making them paid um, as <laughs> Bay Area EMP and the National EMP is really pushing for um, making sure that they're paid so that you can diversify, you know, not only based on ethnicity, but on social economic factors um, and just, you know, really getting ourselves out of the ivory tower um, image that museums have had. And I'll stop there because I can go on and on. <laughs> If I could just quickly uh, piggyback on that, um, I was recently, I, I follow this curator, um, Jasmine Wahi, who was formerly of the Bronx Museum, is now an independent curator, and she recently said something and it just stuck out to me. So um, I think this is especially pertinent to um, to our white colleagues as well, too, especially when you're planning events, panels, things like that. But um, she said, in quote, um, if I'm going to be the only non-white person in your room, table, gala, breakfast, panel, book, etc., please give me fair warning or please don't bother inviting me. Being the only non-white person in a room is extremely uncomfortable. The situation demands that the token is both the spokesperson and the potential gatekeeper. It creates a crushing and unfair pressure that benefits no one. Finally, it creates an opportunity for white people in this situation to operate in a manner of low accountability, using optical diversity as, a, as an excuse to not do real work. Um, and I just read that and I thought that that was particularly powerful. Um, you know, oftentimes as emerging POC within this field, you can be the only POC within, um, within the room. And that's uh, certainly never a comfortable experience. Uh, but, you know, if, um, if we show up, if our colleagues um, also work to make sure that diversity is represented and, uh, and inclusion is really at the forefront of what we're doing, um, then that will manifest in the, um, in, in the, I really think in the quality of the event or program or book, et cetera, so. Amen. You both, and I mean, I think we can all say sometimes, some of us can say we fell into museums, I did as well. Um, I had a great experience at JFK. If we're gonna shout out schools, hi Lacey, hi Samantha, I see you guys. And just thank you so much, Javi, for all the work that you're doing. If I would have known that museums were a career, I would have been in museums long before. So if anyone in the audience wants to talk to Javi about the University of San Francisco Museum Studies Program, please put in the chat. The questions uh, section is open. Tell your friends, tell your mom, go and run and tell the streets. So if we run to the next slide, 
um, we're just um, asking you all, next slide as well, um, with both of us being Emerging Professionals Group and us um, under national, we do have um, a way to talk about salary transparency. Um, please use the QR code. If you see an institution that's not posting the salary, um, we're gonna call them out because if I'm applying, you need to tell me how much the coins are, okay? Because we all need to know what we're getting into. It's a waste of your time, their time, if the pay is not what you need. So as emerging professionals and with national, we are asking for salary transparency. Um, yeah, I believe that is it for us. So thank you very much. Oh, yes, and please contact Bay Area EMP. Um, we are accepting board members at this time. So if you would love to be a part of our group, please contact us on all of our social media platforms and our website. Thank you very much. Thank you, team. Here's another little shout out to join the Bay Area EMP board. This is my EMP group that I was a part of when I still counted as a emerging museum professional and they do fantastic work. It's a great community of folks. Feel free to continue to put any thoughts that you have into the Q&A box. But again, for the sake of time, I'm gonna move us along and ask that the San Diego team go ahead and get us started. Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Mikey Farron. I am uh, the Museum and Visual Arts Manager at the California Center for the Arts Escondido, and I serve on the San Diego Emerging Museum Professionals team. Um, can we go to the next slide? Okay, perfect. Oh, sorry, one more. <laughs> Okay, so a little bit about us. We're part of the National EMP Network. We're based in San Diego, and we are a relatively new board. Just to give a little background about us, um, there are two board members from before COVID, and the two, myself and one other person, who rebuilt the EMP chapter, and the board members that I'm presenting with today, and all of my amazing board members, um, maybe in the audience, maybe not, um, have sort of rebuilt and tried to rebrand San Diego EMP with accessibility and participation in mind. And so one of the things that our group is really passionate about is having honest conversations about the field. So that's kind of what we'll be talking through today, um, but also embracing all of the professionals who may or may not be working within the museum field. So it could be museum enthusiasts, it could be someone like John who has left the field, but still passionate about museum work. Um, and so we really wanted to broaden our sense of what a museum professional can be to really embrace um, and bring people into our group. Um, so next slide. Okay, so today's panel, um, we'll keep it short, but we're gonna address a few big concepts and the amazing panelists from Bay Area. Um, there's a lot of overlap between our panels today. So I think it was perfect that we were together. Um, so today we're gonna go over or just kind of the current climate of museum work. I'll take a few minutes to discuss that. Uh, my panelist will introduce himself. Uh, John is gonna talk about the opportunity gap. So how are emerging professionals struggling to access these opportunities and to get work that pays well, pays a living wage? Um, and finally, we're gonna address how San Diego is trying to create programs that are affordable and accessible to address some of these early career concerns. Um, and we do have a slide if you are not an emerging professional, but someone uh, in senior leadership, how your museum can help us out. Um, so next slide. Okay, so entering the field. Uh, museums, I think, are in this sort of sometimes wonderful, sometimes really scary state of flux. Um, I, for one, was really drawn to museums because of this shift in embracing people and having a sense of community rather than being a repository for artifacts, gatekeepers of knowledge. Um, that never really interested me. And like many have said, I sort of fell into museums too. And really what drew me in was the sense of community. And so I think that shift has provided wonderful and amazing opportunities. Um, but I think part of that is, has been this reckoning and it's been also a beautiful and amazing opportunity. And I hope that we're all getting more comfortable with having these really hard conversations. But I think part of being in the field and being you know, a white worker in the field is really putting a mirror up and saying, what are we doing wrong? 
and how can we open the doors for people rather than close them? And so I think, you know, museums claim to serve their community, but often the demographics of a museum represent not that community, probably not really any community. Um, I'm going to pull from Cam's recent demographic study, uh, which is, I believe they released it in 2012. It seems a little old, but I bet I would be willing to bet it still, it still holds up, which is that museum workers are overwhelmingly female and overwhelmingly white to the tune of 80%. Um, so that 80-20% is actually matched in a lot of museum studies programs as well. So we do see this pipeline that the previous group was talking about where white workers are being filtered into museums and then the staff is overwhelmingly white. Um, they're also, in, depending on the region, um, overwhelmingly English speaking. And so I'm really interested in how linguistic inequality can be reinforced in museums and how language can open up or close doors. Um, so the, um, so these demographics, um, so what we see for the demographics in museums are that workers of color are often in front facing positions. Um, I think we see that in that position more than leadership, curators, and behind the scenes. And so one of the really, um, I think, important struggles to address is that a lot of those positions do not pay well. Uh, they often do not pay a living wage. We have staff members that are working two or three jobs just to pay rent. They're living with many roommates. Um, I know it's sort of, you know, silly to say like, oh, I didn't enter this for the money, um, but I did enter an agreement to have a job that paid my bills. And I think that that's a fair argument for every worker to make. I'm a huge advocate for workers' rights for that reason. And um, so I think that's also something to think about, uh, especially if you are in a position where you are hiring. Um, so that comes into salary transparency, which is another big part of the field right now. We're looking at how can we make things more equitable? And part of that is money. Um, so we need a staff that not only looks like the communities that we serve, um, both racially, linguistically, culturally, we need people of many different classes working in museums. I think oftentimes, um, free internships reinforce the sense that you have to afford to work for free in order to have a job in a museum. And so that's also a huge struggle in the field right now. Um, two other, I think, big deals in museums right now that emerging workers are facing is a lack of open positions. And this is for a number of reasons. I think COVID-19 right now uh, really gets a lot of attention uh, because so many museums had to uh, close cut hours, cut budgets, and cut opportunities. But I think if we're honest, we knew those budget cuts, they were, they were on the table to begin with. Um, a lot of job titles, especially in San Diego, I've noticed have been curator and director of marketing or director of marketing and development director. And we're combining jobs in ways that is unsustainable and also limits opportunity for people entering the field. We also have four generations of workers together in the museum space. So baby boomers are holding on to jobs for longer. We have Gen X, which is often a forgotten generation, millennials, um, and then we have Gen Z entering the field now too. So people are working for longer, they're staying in their positions for longer. And with a lack of opportunity in terms of new positions opening up, uh, it can be really difficult to enter the field and not just be in a front-facing position part-time. You know, the advice is always try an internship, try volunteering, get your foot in the door, uh, visitor services, but this is often not sustainable because the museums truly don't have the positions to offer to try and fill. Um, okay, and then um, of course I would be remiss, it's 2022, just to cover that yes, with COVID, uh, most museums had to cut severe, uh, had to make severe cuts to their staff. 37% that responded to an AAM survey said they just decreased the size of their staff by 28%. Um, and so that has made things really challenging as the shift to get back to normal um, has been slow and inflation is very real and the impending recession is also very real. Um, and when I gave this presentation back in March, I was like, it can be more optimistic. Most museums have responded to surveys saying that they are looking to refill those positions, um, although no one was really sure when that would happen. And now um, it looks like the movement has been a little slower. So I'm a little more cautiously optimistic that these positions will begin to reopen. 
Um, but as we think about these, you know, the struggles of the field, I think there's definitely room um, to imagine what the future can look like and to look at the optimism. And I think the optimism comes for me in looking at who's being left out. Who are we leaving behind with these struggles? Are we choosing to hire the people that look like us because it's easier? Because our pool of connections is shallow and we don't want to put ourselves out there and make new friends and get new opinions and have hard conversations. Um, so I think there's a really beautiful opportunity for museum workers to look inward and to really strive to represent their community in a meaningful way. Um, so that's just a little background on the field. We can go to the next slide. I'm gonna throw it over to John. We're looking for a little bit of participation. So I hope that everyone will put their uh, questions in the chat. We had a good talk in March and I'm sure we'll have another good talk, but I will uh, throw it over to John. Cool, thanks Mikey. Yeah. Um, I believe we have a small poll for everybody. Uh, if we can get that up. If not, I could just ask everyone that is uh, is participant of this webinar. Oh shoot, sorry, John, I was mistaken. They need to use the Q and A, not the chat function. Oh, okay, okay. I guess if if we don't have the poll, it's fine. Uh, it was just a simple question, just to see um, where our attendees are. Um, I guess if if you're considering yourself a and emerging museum professional type a one in the Q&A box. If you're uh, see yourself as more of a manager or leadership position, type a two in the Q&A box and then uh, you can kind of take it from there. Um, oh, sweet. Looks like my audio is doing well. That's great. Um, so I think, yeah, what, what everyone already went over, it's, I think it's really cool to see how much overlap and connectivity there is between um, these two presentations because luckily that means I don't have to talk too much because it would just be repeating what uh, a lot of people said. Um, but the main thing that uh, that we were, or that my portion was presenting uh, back in March was uh, kind of the gap between, you know, an emerging museum professional to whatever that next big step is. Um, it was something that I was personally struggling with because yeah, I've been in the nonprofit Flash museum field for quite a while now, but what is there besides going straight into like a direct foyer role or something like, you know, way up there kind of thing versus just someone that was, uh, you know, in charge of event programming and marketing. Um, there wasn't really anything in between or even any like stepping stones to get, I guess, anyone in my position or in a similar position uh, to be prepared to make that next big step if I was truly interested in that. Um, Cause you know, just, hearing uh, the words executive director after my name is kind of daunting and I'm pretty sure that would be for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, I was, I never really found anything. And, um, you know, when, when the pandemic hit, it kind of exacerbated a lot of things because, you know, there's, there's people that are still very much wanting to be involved or genuinely invested into whichever institution they're in. But then when it came down to it, it's like, well, if they don't want to really take my, um, you know, I guess other skills that I have that aren't directly connected with what I do as my role at the institution, then how can I grow? Uh, where is are those opportunities or how can I actually kind of, um, you know, not completely transfer over, but at least get an idea of what else is available in either the said institution I'm at or in any general museum uh, kind of field. Um, so uh, that's kind of the brief overview of the, uh, uh, I guess the presentation from my part. Most of it, or most of the things that I wanna go over now is with all of you that is in our, I guess, Q&A rather than chat room now, is to just ask a question to everyone out there. Um, if you're, oh, let me see the Q&A real quick. Uh, looks like a lot of EMTs in here right now. Um, so I guess I'll throw it out to all of you. Um, are you aware of any, I guess, specific programs or anything that kind of helps you I guess discover new interest in the museum field or institution you're at, or 
maybe something that helps you grow a specific skill that you're particularly interested in. And if you're on mobile, I think you actually have to tap on your screen to bring up the, um, the uh, option menu and stuff. Um, and yeah, you could just fill your answer in the Q&A portion. And then I guess while we're waiting on people uh, typing that up, for those of you that are in a more leadership managerial position, um, it, was there anything that you started or that you've had available for your team members at your institution to kind of um, cover that, you know, that exploration of um, other positions or developing certain interests or skills that you found within your institution or maybe even the mentorship program? Hopefully people are typing. Um, be... I'll participate with you, John. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, I see a Q&A. Oh, I think we got one. Oh, someone put graduate school. Oh. <laughs> Don't get me started. I'll yeah. go back on mute. <laughs> so there are some things. And yeah, I think Mikey kind of touched up on this, um, you know, graduate school and, and um, I guess degrees are another way of kind of gatekeeping positions. And for technique, that's not exactly needed. Uh, if you were able to read my portion of the, the bio slide, I have an undergrad in kinesiology. And everything after, or every position I've had after that until now was all within the nonprofit world. Uh, so yeah, that that's, I guess, one example of how, you know, degrees don't really, really matter. Um, yeah, and, and Mikey, did you want to go ahead? I was going to say that someone in the Q&A mentioned, mentioned that they have a staff development fund at the Crocker Art Museum. It's administered by a peer committee. So I think committees are a fantastic, um, I'll let you get into it, but I think that's a fantastic way that staff can take advantage of something that's offered from their museum. Yeah, I think um, if I remember correctly, a lot of the, the participants that um, were discussing with us in March um, had a similar kind of program going on within their institution. And then, we got one more that came in. Um, it's like Tomoko, I believe. Oh, someone from San Diego, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, Tomoko. Uh, so she's saying, I had a paid NEA internship, which helped launch my career. But after that, it was just me finding opportunities and connecting with people. At one point, I worked three jobs because I wasn't sure in what direction my career would go. So I think that's a great example that kind of encompasses everything we've been talking about um you know it's a great start but then after that Tomko kind of has to you know more or less be out on her own and um yeah that's where I was hoping you know seeing EMP or San Diego EMP we start up and um get things back together even within the midst of the pandemic and everything um trying to make those opportunities happen and trying to make, I guess, other EMPs just aware of opportunities that we're aware of, um, since, you know, we're most of the time in the actual institutions here in San Diego. Um, got another one from Clark saying that it's actually been connections and opportunities faculty introduced me to. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty similar to what I was kind of going through during uh, that was like a year, year and a half of me just trying to figure out what's next is just asking people, which is great because that could kind of be like a, I guess, unofficial mentorship. But, you know, it, it does it does get tiring if it's just you out there trying to find, figure out your own questions without really any real, I guess, uh, anyone to actually guide you out there to 
uh, certain people, maybe other institutions, or um, I guess, Tomoko, if I could ask, how did you hear of the NEA internship in the first place? And I guess while we're waiting for her answer, um, I think the the overall portion of, of, or I guess the overall message from my portion is to, you know, just kind of keep these things in mind because you do want to question things. Um, if you're not questioning where you're at, you're kind of, you know, blindly trusting that things are going properly and the way you want to. So, and on top of that, the, it's not that bad to just, ask a question and hear someone say no or I don't know because you know there's other people out there that can help you out with that definitely can I jump in I have yeah. like something to... okay yeah. um I would say my advice especially in this because I I noticed that Tomoko put in a comment that was about it's oh. been a lot through connections and like informal not necessarily a mentorship and so I would say that a lot of times the advice is you know get into the field take that internship work for free um, but actually, like, I think put yourself out there, like, it's okay to be a little bit embarrassing and a little embarrassed. Um, but send that email and say, hey, can I take you out to coffee? Or if you have a boss that you really are getting along well with, you can always say, you know, and you know, they might tell you no, and that's okay. And it'll be embarrassing. But you can always ask, hey, you know, I'm interested in talking a little bit more about my future career. And I think, you know, I would really I, ha I admire the work that you are doing. And I would love some feedback. Um, I have an informal mentor and basically it's because she hired me for a job and I never left her. I like still email her now and I haven't worked for her in years, um, but put yourself out there that time. It might feel really awkward and uncomfortable. And I think that's what EMP, at least in San Diego, tries to do. We try to get really good at talking to strangers and making opportunities so that we can facilitate those connections. Um, it never stops being awkward, but just keep doing it. And I think that'll pay off definitely in creating an informal network of people. Yeah, I think that's a great way to end this portion because there there are some places here in San Diego or some institutions that do have like a coffee meet and greet with all NEC members wanting to. And if anything, I mean, you could be that person that starts that at your institution, whether it has to be formal or informal. Um, so yeah, thanks for everyone that were uh, participating in this portion. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. And Tiana, please put it up. Hi all, um, my name is Tiana Lyons-King. I am currently the visitor experience lead at Ninge International Museum down here in lovely San Diego. Um, I also serve on the outreach and, um, excuse me, outreach and advocacy committee here um, with EMP, San Diego EMP. And my portion of this, I'm just gonna re really be talking about, and I'm sorry, could you um, change over to the next slide for me? Thank you so much. So the next thing I'll be talking about are uh, SDEMP's contributions to this entire conversation and issues that we as EMPs are experiencing currently. So the first thing that San Diego EMP did was before I even started, because I just started last year, and as Mikey mentioned, we're a fairly new board. We had a little quiet time because of the pandemic, you know, normal things. Um, what we did was that we started our outreach and advocacy committee. Um, this committee is dedicated to providing resources for our members that are both professionally useful, but also personally useful. This includes job board that we have on our website, as well as um, we're going to be adding on some self-care tips for folks when you're feeling really down in the museum world or per either personally or professionally. Um, I'm sure everyone can here can attest to sometimes when you're doing your job, you feel like really burnt out and you just don't know what to do. And so we're looking to provide resources on how to not get yourself out of the rut, but just have tools for yourself to help you push through with the things that you really do want to get done. On our job board, we really, really, really wanted to advocate for salary transparency, which has been a hot topic. Um, not only in this room, but just in general, it's really important for folks to tell us how much we're going to get paid for something. It doesn't make any sense for me to apply for a job, potentially move my entire life. And I don't know how much money I'm going to be making for that position. Um, 
But we also decided that it may be a little unfair right now for San Diego specifically because things are so weird in our museums right now to not post jobs on our website that are that don't have a, um, transparency. So what we did was on our job board, um, we gave tips and tricks on how to find a job that is right for you. The tips and tricks that we've created are things like look at the salary. If they don't have a salary, potentially ask, um, reach out to the HR manager and say, hey, is there a way for you guys to disclose the salary for this? If you cannot afford to do that, I recommend um, using the national EMP salary, salary transparency that um, Asia is so kindly Posted. I don't know if we can get that to everyone else, but if you just Google national EMP, you can get the salary, salary transparency and you can basically call out people for not posting the salary on their jobs. I highly encourage doing it. Um, it was great because they, they implemented that right when we were talking about how important salary transparency was. So it was like a perfect way for us to get folks all throughout the community to do that. Um, when it comes to our highlights, on our social media for our job boards, we don't post anything that doesn't have a salary transparency. So what we're doing is on the job board itself, we're just posting all of the museums in San Diego that are currently hiring. But then on our social media, if you ask us to highlight a job and that job does not have a salary, we will not post it. Um, along with that, if the job does not pay a certain amount, we will not post it. The amount, the cost of living in San Diego is way too high for us to be okay with posting jobs where someone gets paid $14.50. It's just not equitable. Doesn't make any sense for what we wanna do. Doesn't make any sense for the people who wanna do the things that are we're currently working on. So we just don't do it. Um, some other things that our EMP are doing is we're creating programming. Um, we're like really honing in on community building within the EMP community here in San Diego and anyone in the outer region. Um, I would also say if you find yourself in San Diego and we have an event, please come. If you are an EMP, if, like, if you're a leadership, just please come. Um, the more the merrier, we think, because then you can really hear people's stories and get advice, whether it's you know informal advice or formal advice. You can talk to people, maybe put your foot in the door, like Mikey said, maybe embarrass yourself. It's fine. We probably are all just a little tipsy anyways. We can all joke about it afterwards. It's fine. Um, but with the community building, what we're doing is we're trying to have uh, programming every month. So it has been interesting for our board to come up with programs and events for every month, but we have been successful in doing that and creating programming that's just not like, oh, we just threw, get, threw together a program, but the program is essential to the things that people need. So for example, we've had a panel discussion with all BIPOC folks about how they're how they navigated the museum field and how they're currently navigating the museum field. Um, with on on that panel, there were emerging museum professionals. There were folks who were in leadership. There were folks. There was um, folks who do contract work. It was very diverse, and it was a really good um, panel discussion. We've also done how to get the job that you really want. Um, panels or excuse me, I should say lectures. Um, and we've also had, I think one of our most successful ones was with um, someone who worked at a museum in Balboa Park, which is like where the main hub of museums are in San Diego, who discussed, who casually discussed her journey through the museum field. And I think it really resonated with folks because it wasn't like someone standing at the front of the stage, just like lecturing at you. It was someone who was sitting around a round table with you and just having a genuine, honest, very honest discussion about the things that they experienced and how to navigate this really strange, very strange world of museums that we have somehow jumped into. Uh, going forward with the with EMP, the big thing, and I'm so happy so many people in this room have said it, but mentorships. Um, I would love to create a mentorship program with SDEMP. Um, it's been a little tricky, but if you have any advice or tips on how to get that done, we are very appreciative of it. Um, please email us, um, contact me personally, whatever you have to do, we're trying to get it done. Um, just because we know that mentorships are super important, um, not only for professional growth, but I feel like mentors help people grow personally as well. Um, 
I don't think I would have this level of confidence to sit here today and talk with you all if I didn't have my manager from Sacramento, uh, Michael Shanahan, who really helped me find my voice and find the confidence and give me like this opportunity to learn what I can do and push myself um, further. So I, I, we would love to do a mentorship program here in San Diego. Um, maybe even go larger, all EMPs in California, who's to say, that'd be really cool. Um, and then the last thing is um, how leadership, folks who are in leadership can help. And if you don't mind just moving to the next slide. Um, I won't go too much into this. I'll let Mikey wrap this part up, but I wanna say that if you are a leader in a museum, reach out to your EMP group. Wherever you are in California, in the nation, there is likely a group of folks like us who meet every month and talk about how we can make it a little easier for our community. I recommend reaching out to them and asking me what you can do to help them do that. Um, I will speak right now for our board. If you are a person in leadership in a museum, we would love to talk to you about mentorship programs. Um, call us. We, we really want to talk about it. Um, and I'll end there and I'll let Mikey take the cake. Oh, thanks, Tiana. All right. So how can your museum help? Um, so I think a lot of change begins at the top. Um, we can talk all we want among us as um, emerging museum professionals, uh, but ultimately we are not the decision makers. So we really want to give some easy ideas for how your museum can get involved and start helping out in, um, you know, in immediate way. And I think number one, especially right now in this moment, is prioritize a culture of work-life balance among your staff. You know, we're not neurosurgeons. We are not saving lives out here. We are arts and culture workers. Uh, it is not worth the burnout. We're losing too many good emerging professionals to burnout. The best investment you can make is in your staff. So continue to invest in them by offering them work-life balance model that behavior, don't be available 24 seven and don't expect your employees to be available 24 seven. Number two, we talked about it a lot today, uh, but post honest salary ranges in your description. Don't post 70 to 100K if the only thing on the table is 70 to 75. Be honest um, and really, I think it was kind of in the chat and mentioned a couple of times, but as best you can, a living wage, not minimum wage. Um, so speaking of job descriptions and jobs, review language with a keen eye towards equitable and accessible employment. Um, there's all types of hidden bias within our job descriptions. And I think a lot of times we just have the one that we use in the file and we continue to use that same one. And that's why we keep getting the same types of people applying for that job. Um, so change it, be mindful of especially a kind of, um, had a little bit of attitude over graduate school and like no shade, I loved graduate school. Um, but also a lot of people cannot afford it. And in most instances, you do not need it in order to have a great career as a museum professional and job descriptions should reflect ex and ask for experience or other ways to demonstrate competency that are not necessarily grad degrees. Um, okay, so what else do we have? Oh, and unpaid internships, please. EMP um, in San Diego, is no longer asking for free labor when it comes to people for our programs. And that was one of the things that we are really passionate about and we continue to advocate for in museums. When we hire or when we have someone come and give a lecture or sit on a panel, we pay them. Uh, time is worth something and unpaid internships continue to perpetuate the cycle of only having museum employees that can afford to work for free. Um, that's not fair to anyone. Um, and number five, this one I think is super easy and a really good opportunity for both you and your staff, but include emerging staff members on committees within your organization. Let's teach them how things work. How do boards operate? How do senior leadership decisions get made? Start including them on committees within that organization. And it can be in an observatory role, or you can invite them to give their opinion. It can be that they switch out with other staff members every six months, or it's a year long commitment. It can be project based. There's a lot of different ways to come at that, but start involving them in the decision making process so they can learn how that works. And you might be surprised at how insightful the opinion of someone with fresh eyes is. Um, I think that, you know, emerging professionals 
you know, give us a little credit. We have some good ideas. Um, and things don't always need to operate the same way that they have always operated. Um, and so inviting in a little criticism, never hurt anyone, um, but also just some fresh ideas. Uh, so I, I think do we, we might have another slide. Next slide. Oh no, let's connect. Um, so definitely, like Tiana said, let's contact contact us. Let us know if you're interested in coming to our events, um, starting a mentorship program, being a mentor, you have ideas, um, criticism, let us know. <laughs> We're open. Um, but yeah, so thank you all so much for your time today. And here's um, one last slide of some resources from the San Diego team that you will get a chance to dive more into in the recording that we'll send out. So with that, I want to thank all of our panelists today. Thank all of our participants for coming and joining, um, for participating in the Q&A and the chat. Um, I have just a few last things to share with you on behalf of CAM. So please continue to put your final thoughts, questions, anything you wanna share with the panelists um, into the Q&A box. Um, just really quick, I want to make sure that you have on your calendar um, our next and I believe last lunch and learn uh, session that's scheduled, um, Advancing Equity, the Broads Diversity Apprenticeship Program, touches on several things that we've also talked about today. And Rochelle from CAM will be sending out more information about that with this recording. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that CAM has extended the 2023 conference proposal deadline. Um, the new deadline is next Tuesday, August 16th at 5 p.m. There are a variety of different uh, session types that um, you can uh, propose uh, for this program. This is going to be our uh, first um, in-person uh, conference. In a couple of years, we, of course, had our in-person events this last year, but this is going to be, you know, our big um, statewide event. And I can speak, um, again, as a former uh, EMP who participated in CAM conferences, that this is a really essential um, opportunity for professional development for EMPs. Proposing a session and being a presenter is a great way to, you know, add something to your CV. Um, and to connect with other professionals across the state. And I also, before I we end today, just want to call your attention to um, something shared in the shared in the chat from Jen, our uh, CAMS interim uh, executive director, um, for the equity toolkit, um, a big topic of conversation for today, and something that you can apply to your own work. So with that, uh, we are just about at time. Um, again, keep an eye out in your email for this recording and for the resources that were shared. I want to again thank you for taking your lunch time to join us today. And thank you again to all of our panelists for what you shared today. Thanks again. Have a great rest of your day and week. <laughs>